Okay, welcome everyone. Um, my name is Ken. I'm here with Linkso, and uh, this is one of our Master Gardener classes today. Um, Lisa and Kathleen Putnam will be presenting on fruit and winter pruning. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to them and we'll get this class started right away. And as always, um, the recording will be found on our website and I'll also email everyone the recording as well, um, probably by end of today or tomorrow. So uh, look forward to that in your emails. Um, and I'll turn it over to Lisa and Kathleen. Kathleen, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm just gonna do it. A super quick introduction of Kathleen. I'm Lisa, her sister. Um, and Kathleen is a uh, master gardener, and I'm a master gardener. Um, and Kathleen's also an ISA uh, certified arborist. So she's going to be doing most of the talking today, um, but I'll chime in every once in a while. Okay, and Kath. Lisa's also a master gardener and she runs a small farm. So she is an expert in vegetables and fruit as well. Okay. So we're going to focus mostly on fruit trees. I have a couple slides on cane berries and roses at the end, but the bulk of this is fruit trees and just basic pruning. Oh, you know what? It froze. Let me stop sharing for just a second. Okay. And you'll just do the not play one. Yeah. Oh. Do you want me to share my screen, Kathleen? No, okay. it'll work. Hold on just a sec. Okay. Hi, everybody. Hi, Thank everybody. You. <laughs> Thank you for coming. <laughs> I just have to hit play. Okay. Okay, there we go. Okay. So pruning is both an art and a science. It takes practice, experience, and learning. Kathleen, I'm so good. sorry, uh, but I don't think the PowerPoint's showing on our side here. Oh, showing on mine. <laughs> did you did you hit screen share screen? Yeah, let me do that. Okay. Okay. There you go. There we go. Now I'll play. Okay. Sorry, everyone. Pruning. Do you, does everyone see it? Yeah. Okay. Pruning is both an art and a science. It takes practice, experience, and learning. So you will learn from your mistakes. Hopefully. If you prune the same tree for years, you'll definitely learn. It's it's kind of a conversation, but um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so winter pruning is best for the structure, but it is gonna result in strong growth. Summer pruning is for controlling your tree size. And when you summer prune, you do it at least twice. You cut off the new growth in half in mid spring and again in summer. Um, I summer prune my pluot and my peach and I'm not pruning them this winter because they're at the height I want them. So I'm not gonna touch them. I'm, I'm just gonna cut off dead, diseased, dysfunctional. Okay, reasons for training fruit trees. Keep it small, improve sunlight, rejuvenate fruiting spurs and reduce the amount you need to thin the fruit, which is big because that's, it's hard to thin the fruit. Terminology, branch collar is, it doesn't show up great on here, but every branch has a collar and Lisa actually will demonstrate that in a little bit. Oh, here, you can see it better. See how it bumps out a little bit? There's the branch ridge collar. Crotch angle is this, and you want, this is a really narrow angle, that's not good. This is what, like 45 degrees? Mm -hmm. Heading cut, bad. <laughs> scaffold <laughs> limb, all of these are scaffolds. This is a primary scaffold, this is a secondary, and then these are tertiary. Um, I think that, Oh, water sprout. People always want to know about water sprouts. Water sprouts are, they come, they go straight up off a limb. And depending on your tree and what you're doing, a lot of pruning books say cut off water sprouts. I don't necessarily. And we'll get into that. Open center. This is what most fruit trees are pruned as. 
Um, apples and pears, you can do a central leader, but if you have stone fruit, you're going to definitely do it open center. And you get better fruit production, better fruit, um, because you have better sunlight. Think of your tree as a martini glass with the sun coming in the middle and all the sides, as opposed to a central leader, which is like a Christmas tree where you have one, one main branch that goes from the base all the way up to the top and branches coming off of that. That's a central leader. Um, in the open center, you get much better sunlight. There's a central leader. And pears tend to be, pears really want to just grow up. So I have a pear in my backyard that I do have as a modified central leader and it works well. <laughs> and then espalier, I love espaliers. And once established, they're the easiest thing in the world to prune. Um, they do take a lot of little snips. Mine are in my garden, so I'm back there all the time. And I always have my pruners in my pocket or on my belt. So I just go and prune them a lot. I actually, when I, my sister, my brother have their trees in an orchard, which is great because they have enough room. I have trees in my yard and I actually like having them in my yard because I go and I see them all the time, just as I'm walking through my yard and I prune them all the time. Just a little snip here or there. Branch growth. Okay, so this is the most important thing you can get from this class um, is this information right here. So this is the branch ridge collar. And this is where the tissue is of the tree that will heal the wound. In the old days, they would make a cut like this. They made flush cuts because they thought it looked better. But what they were doing was cutting off all of this meristem tissue. And now we know you make a cut just outside that collar and this tissue will come over and heal it. So every cut you make wounds the tree. You wanna make the smallest cuts possible. Large wounds are more difficult for the tree to heal. And large Cuts also increase the potential for disease and insect damage. And you wanna cut just outside the branch collar and not flush cut or leave a stub. And so again, I kind of harp on this because this is really the most important thing. Even if you're cut, you cut something I wouldn't have cut, if it's a good cut, it's, it's fine. So right here, you can see the branch ridge collars right here and you made a cut right outside of it. This is a maple in my backyard that this is a stub cut and you can see, just look at the tissue here. This is all dead and decaying. So I cut it to the branch ridge collar, but if you look right here, you can see that decay came into the tree. So that's the reason why you want the, the wounds to heal is to prevent this kind of decay happening in the tree. So if you're making a large cut, um, if you don't do this undercut, you can get a tear out, which the, the bark and a little bit of the wood will make this huge wound all down here, which you can't fix. Um, so you wanna cut off the the weight of the branch so that it doesn't tear out. And proper cuts heal. This one's in the process of healing. This one's healed. Lisa and I like to call these sphincters <laughs> because it- they look, um, like, they look like a sphincter. It kind of does. It looks like the back of my dog's end. <laughs> <laughs> but you know you've made a good cut if you have a good sphincter. Yeah, that's a beautiful sphincter. <laughs> My God, that's gorgeous. <laughs> so these are stub cuts and it, you can't see it as well because it's, it's head on, but this is a flush cut. They've cut off all the important tissue and that wound will never heal. Neither will this. It will be like my maple. It will decay all the way out here and the rot will go into the tree. 
This is across the street from me. I hate looking at this tree, but um, it's nothing but stubs. I mean, there's not a single good cut on this entire tree. And they wanted their arborist to come prune my tree. <laughs> and I told them no. <laughs> so types of cuts. There's heading cuts, which you just cut. And then there's thinning cuts where you cut off a, a branch. You go back to the branch ridge collar and you take off the branch. And when you do heading cuts, there's a lot of dormant buds right in here. And when you cut off the tip, the hormones that are keeping those buds dormant are then gone and you get this, the switches broom, just this crazy growth of all those dormant buds start expressing themselves. Lisa, you want to demonstrate now? Uh, sure, yeah. Let me, uh, let me get a nice branch here. Okay. I'll just stop sharing and you okay. start I'll start sharing. talking and then, um, so this is actually, uh, well, we can show you a few things on this. I Go to share like screen, Lisa. Oh, sorry. Okay. Can you guys, can you guys see me better now? No. No. Mm. Uh, I think we just have to uh, stop sharing the screen there. Because right now we just see the desktop. Okay. okay. There we go. Uh, okay. I don't know how well you guys can see me, but. Um, yeah, this uh, is really good. Okay, great. So you can see, um, we haven't gotten into this yet, but you can see these are the buds. That's where your fruit and your leaves are going to come from. And kind of the point that Kathleen was making is we haven't actually, but you're always cutting to something. So if I wanted to cut this branch off, here's my branch ridge collar. You can see it. And you're going to go with your shears and you're going to cut up to the branch ridge collar. And then that is gone. If I want to cut, uh, I already did this. It's funny. Um, if I, so, and that's a thinning cut. That's, that's not going to grow anymore. That's gone. But let's say I wanted uh, this secondary branch to get a tertiary branch. Then I'm going to cut to this bud, right? I cut to the top of the bud. So it's maybe a quarter inch. And then what you're doing is you're, one of those buds will become a branch. Um, that wasn't that great of a demonstration if there's a secondary branch. You're almost all, so I'm gonna get one more branch. So you're either taking a branch off to the branch ridge collar, or you are cutting to an outward facing branch. So if the tree has a middle, the middle trunk is here, and this is a branch, you want the, you're trying to get that sun cup. So you're gonna cut right above that branch. And then that's gonna take the growth and all of the vigor that's in this branch is now gonna be put into here. And that's gonna become another nice branch. So, just the point being, you just never do an indiscriminate cut. You're always cutting to something. You're either cutting to a branch ridge collar or you're cutting to an outward facing branch or an outward facing bud. Okay, Perfect. Kathleen, you can- Thank um, you. Sure. You can screen share anything. Okay. And play. There we are. Okay. So that's the heading cuts and the thinning cuts. I don't know how to put videos in, so I just had Lisa do it. <laughs> so a heading cut, you move the top part of a branch and you get, so they made a cut here and they got all this growth. And they made a cut right here and they got all this growth. This is when they first planted it and you actually want this growth. But a heading cut on an established plant Unless it's a hedge, you really don't want to do heading cuts because you get this witch's broom. 
Um, heading cuts are generally ugly. This was in the Central Valley. Lisa and I were on the way to Yosemite and I made her stop so I could take some pictures. And what they do, what the growers do is they have these tractors with these giant, big, huge round blades. And they just go down the rows of the trees and they just cut them all to the same height. And, you know, for them, the health of the tree is not paramount. Um, the cost of pruning is what makes them decide to do this. This tree has been pollarded. And I, I just put in this picture because I get this question a lot about heading cuts. This is different. You see this in San Francisco in uh, Golden Gate Park between the two museums. There's a bunch of sycamores that have been pollarded also downtown um, by the Civic Center, a bunch of trees have been pollarded. But um, so this spring, you're gonna get a bunch of branches growing out of this tree, but next winter they cut them back to the knuckle on the branch ridge collar. So pollarding is totally different than doing heading cuts. Just an FYI. I really hate heading cuts. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thinning cuts. You just, like Lisa showed, you just remove the branch. It's just that simple. You go to the branch ridge collar and you cut it off. And, you know, what to cut is if it's growing in the middle of the tree, you're going to want to cut it off. But other than that, it's kind of a personal choice and aesthetic. And as counterintuitive as it seems, the more you want a branch to grow, the harder you cut it back. Um, the tree responds to being cut back hard. And by hard, I mean, you take a lot off by growing more. So if you, like I said, I'm not gonna prune my peach and my pluot this winter because they're at the size I want them. If I prune them, they would grow. If I don't prune them, they're gonna grow very little. So if you want a, a large growth response, you're gonna cut them back more. And this comes into play mostly when you get like a three in one or a four in one. And always there is, a, one of those branches is not gonna be as vigorous as the other, or one will be super vigorous and the others will be kind of okay. So your instinct is to cut that super vigorous one back in the winter because it's bigger than the others. But the opposite is actually true. If you have a super vigorous branch that you don't want to grow more, you prune it very little. The less vigorous branches that you want to grow more, you prune back more. So if you prune back 25 to 50%, you get about a foot of growth. This is on young trees. And uh, a really heavy cut, 50%, you'll get a really big growth response. And it is counterintuitive, but it's true. So tools to use. I use bypass pruner, meaning um, this is the anvil plate and the, the blade passes by it, just like a pair of scissors. I have my bucket right here. I also use saws if I need to. There's my saw, which my saws are silkies, but whichever you want. Um, and never use on a living tree an anvil pruner, which just crushes the, the branch. It's fine for dead. I, I, I actually, I don't see the point of having an anvil pruner and don't use loppers because the blade is too big. You can't make a good cut with it and never use pruning sealers. You're actually sealing in moisture and you're inhibiting the tree from, from healing itself. So what to consider before making a cut? I, and I ask these questions in my mind as I'm cutting and it's just kind of instinct now, but when you first start doing this, you should consciously ask yourself, why am I cutting here? What am I cutting to? Can I make a good cut? And how will the tree react to this cut? And be warned, plums will probably not react the way you think they will. 
Okay, bud types. The bud is what produces your fruit. It's, it's the flower, they, you know, the flower forms, it gets pollinated and it makes fruit. Um, that's your flowering buds. And then you have vegetative buds. And like on that branch Lisa held up, the vegetative buds are close to the branch. They don't stick out. The fruiting buds stick out some. Um, I'm just, you guys will get this presentation. So I'm just gonna scroll through these, but this tells you where the fruit is on the tree, um, the amount of pruning, the training system. So it's this, this is really good information, but we don't need to go through it. Okay. So palm fruit, palm fruit is apples, pears, and quince, and they fruit on spurs. And this is a little spur, there's a little spur. Quinces don't, quinces just bud. This is a mature fruiting bud and they're really kind of cool to see, but you can see all of this is all gonna be fruit, lots of fruit. Stone fruit, um, cherries and apricots make these little spurs, plums as well, and peaches, do a three bud. So it's a flower, a vegetative, so a leaf which can turn into a branch or a twig and another flower. The other you can see up here, this might be vegetative. I'm, I'm not gonna guess though, I didn't draw it. So now we're gonna get into individual variety or types of trees. So apples make spurs, this is a, Asian pear almost, it looks like. What do you think, Lisa? Yeah, could be. Yeah, and this is an apple and these are spurs. They're, they're um, really wrinkly and at the tip is where the fruit, where the flower is. You can see it's really wrinkly. And the spurs are good for six to 10 years. I think on pears, 10 years as well. You're gonna prune for structure, thin out older spurs. Um, like that last slide, this slide, some of these I would, I would prune out. This is more than the tree could handle. If every one of these little flowers makes fruit, it's way more than the tree can handle. So okay. I would, rather than having to thin it, I would probably prune out like this guy, maybe this guy, but I would prune out some of that, oops. How do you know if a spur is old or not? Um, it starts to get brown and looks like it's dying. Okay, and on that last slide, when you said I'd prune out this and I'd prune out that, I mean, but then that's never gonna fruit again. I mean, after you prune that spur off. Correct, although that spur will continue to grow. All right. But yeah, I mean, you never want that much spur flowering on that because, Too much. you know, it's kind of like permanent fruit thinning. Yeah. Um, and pears are very, oh, and you're going to want to be careful about the end weight with apples and pears. If you have a lot of spurs out on the end of a branch, it, the branch can get too heavy and it can rip out. And we'll say that for a few of these trees. Um, and pears want to go up really big time. It's hard to get a pear to not grow up. So I have spacers. Actually, let me get a smaller one. If, if you have a tree that's that's the pear, especially pears, that's, but any tree that it's growing just right up, you can put a spacer in it to get it to bend down. You can also put weight on the end to get it to bend down and I just happen to have those with me, but more often than not, I just use a twig as a spacer. <laughs> is that your dog? That's a happy dog oh. that saw Chris is going somewhere. Oh, okay. Okay, so common insects for apples and pears, this is apples only, is coddling moth, which is the worm you get in your apple. Um, there's not much you can do about it. There's hormone traps you can set, but unless everybody in your neighborhood does it, it's not gonna be effective. So the most effective thing is to thin the fruit when it's fairly small so that they don't touch. 
because that's where the adult lays their eggs. And if there's not a spot for her to lay her eggs, you won't get worms in your apples. And then um, this is woolly apple aphid. This is how a tree responds. You can see there's a little bit of activity right there, but mostly this is just the tree's response to woolly apple aphid. It's, it's not attractive, but um, it's not a huge issue. It's not gonna affect the health of your tree significantly. Um, Lisa and I took a class from Pam Pierce and she was putting rubbing alcohol on hers to control the uh, woolly apple aphids. I've never tried to control them because they make this, this waxy coat and you sprays don't penetrate it. So I just think they're kind of cool and I just leave them alone. If it's a big issue, you can get resistant rootstock. M111 or M106 are resistant. And fire blight. This is mo more on pears than apples, but they're on both. They're also on pyracantha, loquats, quince. The quince gets it really bad. Um, and you get this burnt look, which is why they call it fire blight. It just looks like it's been burned. And it's a bacteria, so there's nothing you can do about it. There's not an antibiotic you can give your tree. But what you wanna do is cut it out as soon as you see it. And it starts in the flower. Bees bring it from an infected tree to your tree through the flowers. Um, so if you look at your trees a lot, you catch it really early and it's not that big an issue. You just go down to the, the next place you can make a clean cut and you cut right there. This one, it's probably further down to make a clean cut, but I'm just using that because that's a branch where you could make a cut. Um, you'll know if you got it, you look at the branch and if you still see brown in the middle of it, you need to go down further in your cut and go down to the next branch junction and cut there. Uh, anything on fire blight, Lisa? Um, no, I think that covers it. Asian pears get it really badly. Yeah. Um, I did have an Asian pear and it was all over the entire pear. So I cut it off like a very drastic cut, just, um, oh, like a foot above grade and it came back. So um, it just, it depends on the tree. the tree. The tree came back. Oh yeah. Sorry. Not the <laughs> fire blight. No, the tree survived, which was amazing to me. Um, so, you know, I mean, sometimes you have to do drastic things and you just, it, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. It's just an experiment. Yeah. What about putting this in your compost pile? No, yeah, I don't. Green bin? Green bin. Yeah, okay. There are some varieties that are more resistant than others. And again, you'll get this in a PDF, I think. So. Just know when you when you buy the tree, and if you go like on Dave Wilson's website, there's probably more now. They will say if it's resistant to disease. And with pears, you can get a rootstock that gives the tree some resistance. And again, I say resistance because none of this is perfect. It's not. It's not like a vaccine where the tree is going to be. 96% safe. It, um, you know, if, if, if you have a lot of fire blight in your neighborhood and it can be on ornamentals that then come into your yard, or if your tree is not healthy, but even healthy trees get it. So never mind that. If you have a lot of fire blight in your neighborhood, you're probably going to get it. It's, you see it a lot on ornamental pears. So that's where it starts. Prune apricots and cherries in August. They get a disease called Eutypa. And this is what it starts out looking like. And this is what it ends up looking like. And you get this gamosis or this sap seeping. And I believe it is 
well, let's see. No, do I have it? I think it's a bacterium. No, I think it's a fungus because it's water. Anyway, if you want to prune your apricots and your cherries and then have six weeks of dry weather. So, I mean, last winter you could have pruned in the winter, but we didn't know that. You don't know what the weather's <laughs> going to be six weeks out. Um, so I, I just pruned my apricots and my cherries in summer and pluots, any cherry derivative, which they now have tons of, or sorry, oh, it's a any apricot um, that's a parent, like my pluot also gets this, yeah. which I didn't know. And I did an experiment and now I know that it gets it because my pluot now has it. Oh no. Yeah, it is a fungus. Uh, you're right. It's a fungus from the family di tri Oh, well, that makes it clear. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> um, so just prune your apricots and your cherries in summer. And plums, I think. But so apricots, you don't need to worry so much about end weight because the fruit's not so big. But you do want to prune new shoots back two thirds and thin new shoots by one third just for fruit thinning. And this is well spaced. I think this has probably been thin because that's pretty well spaced fruit. And this is what the, the fruiting spurs look like. This is where, so you can see there's a flower, there's a flower, there's a flower. You're gonna have too much fruit right there. So you will need to thin your fruit. Um, and cherries have these little spurs. Cherries, um, I love to eat cherries, but cherry trees in our area don't do great. I don't know if they're worth planting personally. Yeah. I mean, and some people in the area do have, uh, when we say areas, mid peninsula, um, but I know somebody with a cherry tree in Atherton and it's amazing, you know, it's 20 to 30 feet tall, 20 to 30 feet wide, covered with cherries every year but it was probably planted a long, long time ago. But I've planted several cherries and well, I get a little crop, but usually the birds get it before I get it. Yeah, and they're pretty hard to, to pent, yeah. to put netting on. Yeah. Yeah, and, and they get so many diseases. But cherries, you know, you have spurs for two to 12, for, I'm sorry, 10 to 12 years, thin out interfering branches and remove dead and diseased. Yeah. And they're pretty. I mean, I will say that. Yeah, they are. They're beautiful. The reason I put this in is I was, um, I was taking care of some of my brother's fruit trees for a while and his cherries, this cherries just get covered in aphids and then the leaves curl up and it, People think that they have peach leaf curl, but it's a cherry, so they don't. But um, so I went out there and I sprayed with neem oil and I saw this little bug and I was like, yeah, I'm killing two bugs. This is so great. And I went to look up what this bug was that I had just killed and found out it was there eating the aphids. <laughs> so, <laughs> so he's a soldier beetle. <laughs> he's a soldier beetle. And he was there eating the aphids. So before you spray for aphids, just look around and see if nature's helping you out. And if it is, maybe take a step back and let nature do her job. Yeah, and you guys probably already know this, but um, like the, um, the ladybug, the larval stage of the ladybug, it looks like a teeny tiny alligator. Yeah, they're um, very ugly. Yeah, they're ugly, but um, those, they eat like a thousand aphids a day. Um, so they're very, very effective for aphid control. However, don't go and buy ladybugs. Um, for one thing, ladybugs don't eat very many aphids compared to their larval stage. And they just go and they mine them in the Sierra foothills. They're not hatching them in hatcheries or something like that. They're just going and taking them uh, from the Sierra foothills. And then the uh, farmers in the Central Valley are having problems because they keep taking all the ladybugs from the uh, Sierra foothills, which would normally be uh, Central Valley. And when you buy ladybugs, they eat maybe 
a little bit of your aphids and they fly away because you don't have enough aphids for the population in that container. So it's, it's just not good. Don't do it. And if enough people quit doing it, they'll quit going and selling them in nurseries because they'll die. They won't be good. Okay, plums. Um, depending on the plum, if you have like a French plum, you don't really need to worry about the end weight. Uh, but the spurs are good five to 10 years, thin lightly for structure. You don't want to prune a plum really hard because they respond in odd ways. Um, this says remove water sprouts and suckers at base. I always remove suckers. Suckers are your rootstock. They're not your actual tree. But water sprouts, especially if you have pears and apples, I generally leave the water sprouts because if you get fire blight, you might need to cut back to that water sprout. And those water sprouts will one day become fruit bearing branches. So I don't just cut every water sprout I see. I think about where it is, what kind of tree it is, and if someday I might need that water sprout. Same thing with apricots. If you have you type it really bad, you might prune it back to a water sprout. Peaches and nectarines, they bear on last year's wood and they have this three bud like Lisa was showing you. This is a fruiting bud. It kind of sticks up and out. There's a flower, there's a flower and this is vegetative. So you're gonna find like that branch Lisa was holding up, there was probably, I don't know, a dozen fruiting spurs on a branch. So when I prune, I look at how many fruiting spurs there are. I pull down on the branch to see how much weight it can hold. And I, I would maybe cut right here to keep this fruiting spur, but to get rid of all the ones up here because this branch looks pretty skinny and it might be able to hold one peach. Um, but peaches, you really, really need to be aware of crop load. Peaches tear out all the time because it, they start out, they just get really heavy and it puts a lot of strain on those branches. And if it's too much weight for that branch, they're just gonna tear out. And once you have a tear out, it was like I was showing you on the, um, the pruning cut. Once you have a tear out, you have a wound that, you know, if this was a big branch, and it tears out, you're gonna have a huge wound all down along there. And there's nothing you can do about it because it, it goes down into the main trunk and it's bad. So worry about um, crop load a lot with your peaches. Peach leaf curl, they say you should spray um, at least once a year, twice if we have a wet winter. Um, it's up to you. I don't spray my peach in my own backyard. I do spray my clients peaches because they don't like peach leaf curl. Um, you spray with a fungicide, the fung you have to spray until the fungicide is dripping off the tree to be effective. And it's dripping then onto your soil. You could tarp underneath the tree when you spray so that it doesn't get into your soil and kill the life in your soil. But if you don't put a tarp and you just spray, make sure you mulch heavily before. Yeah. Um, I just don't think it's worth it. In my own yard, I don't think it's worth it. It's, it's an aesthetic question. It will shorten the life of your tree a, probably a couple years because you get, the, you get these distorted leaves and peaches and nectarines are the only thing that get this. If you see distorted leaves on any other tree, it's not peach leaf curl, look for an insect. But um, you get these distorted leaves and then they fall off and the tree refoliates. So I just live with it. The, the leaves fall off, I clean them up, put them in the green bin and life goes on. If this really offends you, you can spray with a fungicide. Um, do it after the 
all the leaves fall off your tree. And if it's a really wet winter, do it again around the Super Bowl is when they say, but you'll see the buds starting to swell. That's when you should do it. Um, anything on this, Lisa? Um, no, I, I do the same thing you do. I just wait for them to all fall off and then it refoliates. And I didn't have, this past year, I had very little peach leaf curl. Yeah, well, it was so dry. Yeah, we just never fungus. had, it's a fungus again. Almost everything's a fungus. Um, yeah, yeah, except fire blight. And fire blight, since it is a bacteria, if, if somebody comes by and tells you they can spray your trees for fire blight, don't hire them. <laughs> they can't. Okay, thinning the fruit. This is one of the hardest things to do is you see all these wonderful fruit that you wanna eat all of them, but you actually need to thin them because the tree can't support all of this. And so you take off probably 75%. Yeah. Uh, this I would, no, this is actually pretty good. Maybe it, it depends on how big these are gonna get. Yeah. Um, I, yeah. Go ahead. I used to take off 50% of my fruit when it was kind of the size of my baby fingernail uh, or a little bit bigger. Um, and that's just not enough. So now I, I take off 50% when it's pretty little, but then I go through and I take off another 50% um, when it gets bigger. And I'm happy I do. I mean, my peach trees are three years old. Uh, this was the first year that I let them completely fruit. And I had, I had more peaches than you knew what to do with, you know, and that's after two thinnings. And I probably still had several hundred peaches at least. Yeah. And then they're nice big peaches. Yeah. Instead of little tiny peaches. I, I will say I, I thinned the pluots when they were itty bitty tiny, like just starting to look like a fruit. Yeah. And I shouldn't have. They have a drop. Oh. And I I thought I'm going to get a jump on this before they get too big. So you want to wait until they're at least the size of your pinky fingernail or even a little bit bigger before you start thinning. Yeah. And um because like apples have a drop, pears have a drop, and when I say drop, the fruit drops the the tree, sorry drop some of the fruit itself. It knows it can't support that much fruit, so it drops it. Um, so just be aware that when it's really small, I think peaches don't have a drop. So you could thin a peach. Yeah. But um, some fruit do have a drop and just be aware that you don't wanna thin all the fruit before then. And sometimes like with apples, I'll wait too long, hoping it'll have a drop and then it doesn't. Yeah, that's happened to me. It's called a June drop for an apple. So you wait till after June to thin your apples, but it doesn't always happen. Right, exactly. Um, so this is again thinning and you can see, like if you look in that, that picture of spurs, it's just, you know, every, Every flower got pollinated and grew on this little spur of this plum. So you take it down to one, which is a pretty good rule is if, if it's a spur and there's a cluster, take it down to one per cluster. Apples and pears, again, this is where that, um, the codling moth eggs will be laid. If you take those out and you just have this one, then you have one nice apple without a worm inside. Yeah, and I'm not, we have to do a little more research on that. I'm not positive that's always the case. I mean, and if you want to baby your tree or if you have time on your hands or you can put like a little, um, they sell them, but it's like a little bag over each piece of fruit and that also protects it. Um, you know, I guess if you just had one apple tree with, I don't know. I mean, I, I couldn't ever see myself doing it, but <laughs> no. uh, if you wanted just 25 apples and you bought 25 of those bags and tied them on, I guess you could do that. Some people do, uh, you know, it just depends on yeah. your tolerance. Yeah. Although it won't color up as nicely if it doesn't get sunshine. 
Yeah, I think they're they make them with different, you know, like so the so sun still exactly. Yeah, yeah, like you could put a nylons on them or something. I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, it just I just not. thin the fruit. Yeah, and that's pretty good. And you know, if you get a worm in your apple, it's not the end of the world. Yeah, it's just a little protein there in your carbohydrate. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of good for you, probably. Yeah. <laughs> okay, blackberries. So you don't prune blackberries at all the first year, but after the first year, you're going to prune them twice a year. The first pruning in the winter, and you're going to prune out the lower side branches that are below your wire. So blackberries, you want to grow them on a trellis, and you want your trellis to start at about what two and a half feet, Lisa. Where's your lowest wire? Oh, it's no, it's closer to the ground than that, I would think. Two feet. Yeah, probably two feet. Yeah. Okay. So any any lower side branches that are below two feet you're going to take out and then the laterals at the top of the trellis you're going to cut them back by a foot yeah i'll just say one little note here do some research when you're buying your blackberries or any berry any cane berry um i have a raspberry that i'm really happy with and it has a nice growing pattern i have a blackberry that it just wants to go along the ground like a ground cover and as much as I try to get that up onto the trellis, it takes me an incredible amount of time. And it's just its growing habit. It, it wants to be a ground cover instead of a cane berry. And I'm actually going to take it out. I just, I don't, you know, anyway, I just don't have the time and energy to, and berries can get really unmanageable really quickly. So yeah. I like triple crown. I mean, like the flavor on some of them, Triple Crown might not have the best flavor, but it has such a nice growing pattern and it's so easy to manage and you get thousands and thousands of berries. I mean, I kind of would rather have that than one I'm just struggling with to make it into a cane berry when it wants to be a ground cover. And a lot of blackberries are just super, super vigorous and it's really hard to keep them under control. Yeah. That you do want to do the two prunings to, to keep them manageable. I took the cane berries out of my yard. I just didn't have room. Yeah. They take up a lot of room yeah. and you need a good trellis. But the, um, at the end, I have resources and uh, UC IPM has some great pictures of trellises for blackberries and raspberries and they explain stuff a lot better than I probably will. But the second pruning you do just after harvest and you cut out the canes that bore fruit by cutting them down to the ground because they're not gonna bear again. And then raspberries, um, prune out spent fruiting canes, they'll dry up. I mean, it's, it's pretty obvious on a raspberry what's a spent fruiting cane, it dries up and gets brown. And then keep 10 to 12 of the healthiest new canes. And raspberries spread underground and, and they just pop up all over the place. And just to keep it in control, you just like here, you know, if you had raspberries growing up over here, you're going to want to cut those off. And you just keep this nice bunch of them and you just put them up the trellis. And that's the best way to keep raspberries under control and get nice fruit because if you have too much then your fruit's not as good it's like thinning fruit on fruit trees but with cane berries you thin the fruit by thinning the canes yeah. and roses so i went to um ucipm and they they when you click on one of the plants types of plant you get to its page and it lists all the all the diseases and insects that they have. And most of them have, you know, maybe a dozen, probably not even that many. Roses, it's like three pages. I mean, I love roses. I have roses in my backyard, but roses have a lot of issues. 
I mean, it's a good thing they're so beautiful and they smell good. <laughs> Nobody would grow them. <laughs> but roses are kind of like fruit trees in miniature. You want that same sun cup, you just don't have the stem. So it's like a little martini glass right there on the ground. But, and I see so many roses prune badly. All the principles apply to roses as it does to fruit trees. You wanna make a good cut at the branch ridge collar. It's easy to see, it's easy to do. Uh, Lisa and I went to a fruit pruning at UC Davis about years ago. And we went up with the, an amazing arborist and he was complaining that they were making bad cuts and it doesn't take any longer to make a good cut which is so true. I mean, it might take you a second longer to make a good cut versus a bad cut. But for some reason, people think roses don't need to be pruned the same way fruit trees do. And I just see so many bad cuts. It's amazing. So make a good cut on your roses, cut to the branch ridge collar. And, you know, you do that for the first couple years and you establish a nice structure and then it's just super easy to prune them from there on out. Yeah, and also it, to the branch ridge culture, if, if you are thinning them, if not, if you're just deadheading, which isn't pruning, um, but you, you're gonna, the same principle applies no matter what. And that's cutting to an outward facing branch an outward facing leaf. Um, so you're getting that nice sun cup. So you're getting the, um, the light penetration coming in, you're gonna, you know, fruit is, I mean, uh, roses are obviously in the same family as a lot of the fruit trees we were just talking about. I think they're almost all rosaceae. Um, so you'll get more flowers, just like you get more fruit if you're doing proper uh, proper pruning. Yeah. And I think most people have their roses for the beauty of the roses in the garden, and then you cut the flowers, but you appreciate the rose on the plant. So you don't wanna take a ton of wood off in the winter or you're gonna get really vigorous growth in the spring. You will get less flowers, the more wood you cut off, but they'll be bigger. So it kind of depends on what your objective is. I don't prune mine very hard. I actually deadhead them I don't go to the first five leaflet, I, I go further down. So I do kind of a summer pruning when I go and, and take my flowers. So my roses don't need a lot of winter pruning. That's it. When you don't know what to prune, cut something. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> and you, I mean, you do have instincts about it. You'll see, you know, just, branches that are out of place. And if a branch looks weird and out of place, cut it off. Yeah. This is, this oh, is yeah. at the pet cemetery. Mm -hmm. And um, I was supposed to be very sad and looking at the ground, but I'm always looking up. And I saw this and I had to take a picture because this is heading cut over and over and over again. And this is just all dormant buds that popped. You know, they, they cut it off here. Plus it has a um, passion flower growing up it. Oh. But yeah. they, they just cut it off here and they just, they're doing it probably for size control, which is what most people do when they make a heading cut like that. And instead what you get is just this crazy vigorous upright growth that is the opposite of what you want. So don't do heading cuts. Have fun. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's our brother, Kent, and his dog, Jacko. Jacko. And we were told to not let him dig, which clearly we disregarded our instructions that day. <laughs> <laughs> he was a happy dog, though. <laughs> okay, there's a whole bunch of references. And some of my favorite what websites for fruit tree information and the UCIPM is excellent. So is the um, UCANR if you want to get some books. Those growers are all really good and they have information beyond just what trees to buy. 
And if you have questions, ask the master gardeners. And thank you, Ling So. Yeah. And then I think um, Can you're gonna give us some questions from the chat. Yep, I've got I've got quite a few questions here. So we'll start with actually. Um, uh, I'll go back and just read the questions to you folks. Um, so here's one. So this one kind of asks if you already cut too much by cutting too much of the collar, is there anything that they could do to help the tree? Mm. Uh, so you cut the meristem tissue off. It sounds like from the question. Yeah. Uh, I, you can't grow meristem tissue. I mean, yeah. Have, no. What about heading if you've already just, you know, top the tree I guess off. it would depend on on how high up the trunk you made the cut. You could go back down to the next good branch and make a cut and just cut off that part of the tree. Um, but if it's on the main trunk or a main scaffold branch, it's going to be pretty tough. I know Lisa on her peach tree had a big tear out on the top that went down probably two feet. Yeah. And there was nothing we could do. No. And there's, there's like no treatment that you can put on it to help it. No, I mean, I just cleaned it up. But, um, you know, I should go look at that tree and see. That was several years ago now. But, um, and that's a case of I should have thinned the fruit more. You know, I that particular tree is a very, very prolific tree. And uh, anyway, you know, you get hundreds of peaches and they each weigh half pound each. You've got 400 pounds of peaches and um, they're going to tear things out if you don't thin. Okay, next question. Okay. All right, so next one is last week, November 29th, my two and three-year-old dwarf apple trees bloomed South Santa Clara County, yeah. South Facing Slope, 2300 eleva elevation. Yeah. So much older full-size apple tree is not blooming. Uh, any suggestions and will it not bloom next spring? My pear tree bloomed as well down in Santa Cruz. Um, you know, you could take the blooms off if, if it's a big tree. Well, it sounds like it's a small tree. I, I would probably take the blooms off and hope that it blooms again. But there's nothing you can do. I mean, this, this warm weather we had just really messed up our plants. Yeah, it's a, it's a weird. I was just out hiking in, uh, just in nature, and I noticed the wild plums are blooming already, which is unusual. Um, but I think in Kathleen, I just, I didn't realize this. Kathleen just told me about um, what we've only had. I'm in um, Woodside, Portola Valley area. And we've had three nights with frost. Usually our first frost is about October 15th. This one, it was late November. And then we went into really warm weather. It was last week, a couple weeks ago. And uh, we went into weather where it was 72 to 78 every day. And then that reversed all of those chill hours. So um, it's just harder and harder to get chill hours. Um, so I know Kathleen, when she's planting orchards out, she's now looking for trees, which are two to 300 chill hours instead of five to 600 chill hours. And chill hours is temperature between 32 and 45. And Tree, fruit trees, <clears throat> other trees as well, need so many hours in that, in that range before they break bud. Um, I had a client who planted some um, northern highbush blueberries, which have like a thousand chill hour requirement, which we'll never, we're never going to get that. She, you don't want to plant northern highbush blueberries, but her her other blueberries that were southern high bush have fewer chill hours and they broke bud in spring and they were doing great and <clears throat> her other blueberries were not leafed out in July and she wanted to know what I had done wrong and I didn't plant them thank goodness well I wouldn't have planted them but um 
when we found out what they were, I told her, you know, these are never going to be successful here because you're never going to get the amount of chill hours they require to break bud in spring and start growing. And, you know, Santa Clara Valley probably used to have 800 chill hours, but because it's all now buildings and freeways and, you know, things that, that stay warm during the night, our chill hours are going down and down. So yeah, that's a problem. Okay. All right. So the next question is, um, well, it's really an explanation of why we should not be using loppers for printing. Oh, good. I guess they want so if you can just. <laughs> uh, the explanation, I think, for us, it's because the blade is too thick. Um, you you too can't, big. yeah, you can't get this up against the branch ridge collar because it's too thick. So that's why a hand pruner. And then could you also talk about the spacers, the use of spacers? Oh. Yeah, let me get. Or Kathleen, do you want to stop sharing screen, screen so you're bigger? No, I can just do it like this. So these I got from Fedco. You get a pack of them like this of different sizes. And um, there we go. Oh, there's my camera. <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> and so you take this, this little spacer and they have little spikes on the end. So they don't fall off the tree. There you go. And if you have a branch that's going really upright, you put a spacer on it and you, you put it against something else and it just keeps that branch down. And you only need to do it six months or so. And then that branch is then gonna be down like that for its life. Yep. That explain it? Yeah, I think that was perfect. Um, let me well, you go. could do like my sister who doesn't like to buy things mm -hmm. and she just takes Coke bottles or whatever, water bottles and fills them with water and ties them on the end of the branch. I actually like spacers more because you don't get that, that bow like you do with putting weight on the end of the branch. Yeah, You actually get a good crotch angle. <clears throat> Alrighty, so the next question is, when do you prune cherries if you live on the coast with foggy, damp summers? And before you answer, I guess there was a suggestion on the chat saying you never want to prune cherries. So maybe we could kind of clarify that. Well, on the damp, wet coast in the summer, you're probably never going to get a cherry. But that aside, um, August. Yeah. August, September is really the nicest, even September. Yeah. Yeah. You know, August or September, I think is, is your best odds. Yeah. And that's after you harvest the huge crop you're going to get. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, it's pretty dry in August and September as far as coastal weather. And it's, it's as good as it's going to get anyway. Yeah. And, and be careful with cherries. Cherries sunburn super easily. So if, if when you prune it, you're exposing a lot of um, the bark to sunlight, you're going to want to paint it with a 50-50 um, mix of latex to water. It's just kind of a whitewash. And you just put that on for sun protection. Yeah. Kathleen, yeah. I see in the chat, a lot of people want to see you bigger. So maybe you should stop sharing screen. Okay. Okay, so, um, and then on the same topic of cherries, uh, do you thin the cherries as well? Because there was a comment no. here saying that you don't thin cherries. No, yeah, you, you don't need don't. to thin cherries. They don't weigh enough. They're tiny. And you you can get a whole cluster of cherries and it's fine. Um, I do. You do want to prune cherries though because the 
But for the same reason, you want good structure. Yeah, exactly. You want to prune them to an open center and, you know, then anything growing into the middle, you'll prune out. And depending on how tall you want it, you're going to want to do some size control on it as well. Okay, all righty. So the next question is, um, my plum tree gets a lot of little fruits and then they all wither and fall um, mm -hmm. when they're so little. Then the leaves turn yellowish later in the season and it has done this for about three years. So what's wrong with the tree? Um, it probably isn't getting pollinated. No. I don't know what kind, but most plums need to be pollinated. They might need to graft a, a branch of a different kind of plum on. If, if they know what kind of plum it is, I would go on Trees of Antiquity and look at their information sheet and, um, and see what kind of plum it is. And they will also say what they need to get to pollinate it. Um, I know my pluot, I'm relying on my neighbor, my next door neighbor's Santa Rosa plum to pollinate my tree. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it sounds like it's not getting pollinated. Why it's turning yellow, it probably isn't getting the nutrients it needs. I would cover crop. I would put a nice mixture of California native wildflowers and some native California grasses under it, especially under the drip line, which is where the canopy ends. And that's where most of your feeder roots are. And I would improve the soil. I'd probably add some compost and mulch that and cover crop into that. Yeah, and I should say, if you wanna know what cover cropping is, I think we've done a talk for Lingso's on cover cropping. So you could probably just look at their video library and, um, and see cover cropping. And I, I saw in the chat something about citrus, same thing. We um, did a talk on citrus and we have another one coming up and um, you could go and look at that video, but this one's, a, this particular class is deciduous uh, fruit trees. And hopefully your citrus isn't deciduous. <laughs> All okay, right. Cam. Oh. Next question is for peaches. We're seeing fruit infested with what appears to be earwigs. Um, are there any printing recommendations to address earwigs? Hmm. I, I haven't come across I would, that I would, before. Yeah, I would go to the UCIPM website. It's a great website. And if there's nothing specifically on peaches, you know, click on the peaches tab. If they don't have anything on earwigs, there is a search box and I'd go up to the search box and search. I see earwigs on strawberries a lot. I don't think I've ever seen them on peaches. Yeah, I've never seen it on a peach. That's curious. Yeah, but certainly something to look into. Yeah. Google. Earwigs okay. are kind of creepy. <laughs> <laughs> but they don't hurt you. They don't pinch you. I know, but they look like they will. All righty. So the next question is, do we thin, do we need to thin fruits um, on plums or plum trees? Uh, you don't like heading cuts, but my tree has grown so tall. I can't reach all the fruits with a telescoping picker. How do I encourage lower fruits? Okay. Yes. You thin your plums unless it is a little French plum, which they get about this big, but your plums will get too big to, because plums cluster, the, the fruit is a little cluster of flowers and you'll have too many fruit, it'll tear out. Um, as far as bringing your tree down, you know, you, you probably have branches. So here's your main branch and then you have other branches coming off of it. Just go down to one of those branches that's coming off of it and cut it off there. Yeah, like I can. Yeah, at least it can demonstrate. I don't have a branch with me. Yeah, so I mean, the reason why it's too tall is because it has too many heading cuts. So you don't wanna keep exasperating that. So let's say this is your main trunk. If you wanna take it down in size, you're gonna take it to an outward facing branch. If you want it even lower, you're gonna take it to that outward facing branch. And you just keep going until you get to where it's low enough to an outward facing branch. I think there's like a rule of thumb. 
you don't want to take off more than 30% of your tree each year. So you would do it probably over three years. But to bring it down, you're going to bring it down to a lateral branch and just keep bringing it down. So you're, again, as we said, you're just always cutting to something. Um, uh, when you just do the indiscriminate cuts, that's when you get super, uh, super bad attachments and super tall trees. Okay. Okay. All righty. So after I did heavy thinning on my peach last year, the peaches were large, but the pits split on a number of them. Any recommendations to prevent this? Hmm. That seems... might be a water issue, but I'm not sure. I would look that up. Um, I'm not positive. Yeah. I've, I've seen that before, but I yeah, don't I have to. But I don't know what it is either. All righty. So we'll move on to a different oh, one. I know you call the master gardeners. Yeah, call the master gardeners. They're, they're required by law to look up your answers. Yeah, they go to jail if they don't. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> Kathleen, you were talking about the bags. Um, someone's asking, what's the point of the bags, the nylon mesh bags, I think? Oh, it's we just were talking about those to keep the uh, the codling moth from laying eggs in your apples. Yeah. So I have seen it. I've seen it in a house in Palo Alto where they went and um, put these little bags around each fruit. It does work. It's just that's it's just a heck of a lot of work. You know what our aunt did? What? She put bottles over her pears. Oh. <clears throat> And then there the are pear grew inside the bottle, and then she put alcohol in the bottle, and she made like some liqueur. I don't know, but That's it kept cool. the cobbling moss off. Yeah, I mean it's pretty clever, right? <laughs> How do you get a pear inside a bottle? <laughs> I'm gonna try that. I think That's cool. Yeah. Okay, so um, <laughs> speaking of thinning apples, why do you still thin apples when there's a June drop? Oh, because there's not always a June drop. Yeah, and it, it doesn't drop necessarily what you want gone. Yeah. Like in, in, in any thinning, you're going to thin heavier on the, on the outside. And if you have like three peaches along the main trunk, that's fine. The main trunk can hold three peaches. But if you have three peaches on the very tip of a, of a little branch or three apples on the very tip of a little branch, that's going to break out. And June drop is not necessarily going to drop those three. Yeah. It's going to drop some apples, but it's not going to drop necessarily the ones you want dropped. So, I mean, the tree's not, I don't want to say the tree's not smart enough because the tree's probably smarter than I am, but the tree isn't necessarily knowing the physics of the branch. Yeah. Although it might. Oh. Okay. Um, is there a pruning book with illustrations to follow that you can rec recommend? Yeah, a little fruit tree. Um, do you have it there? Yeah, talk for a minute, Lisa. <laughs> oh, I don't have anything. I'll just tell you an interesting fact that Kathleen told me a few years ago. The tree knows how many calories it's going to put out that year. So it's going to put out 10,000 calories. So why we, I know we're emphasizing thinning a lot, even though it's a pruning class. Um, so you're going to get 10,000 calories no matter what. So you can get that in a hundred fruit, or you can get it in 300 fruit. And that's what makes your fruit size up is um, taking it off because the calories are going to be the same. Yeah, that's a good, you should, your camera's in the middle of your screen, Kathleen, then you need to move it away <laughs> a little bit. That's a little close. There you go. A little, little more, a little more, a little more. There this you go. This is a great book. You can get this at um, UC ANR. It's really good. And it has pictures and stuff oh, and yeah. just for general pruning this is a really good book the horticultural the american horticultural society pruning and training it's a good book too i there's also a book it's in my resources called a little fruit tree 
And um, that's a very good book as well. It's downstairs, sorry. <laughs> okay, so what about printing grapes? You need to know if they are cane bearing or spur bearing and go look it up. <laughs> Sorry, and I'll just apologize. We used a description for this class from a few years ago and um, really the class is meant to be on deciduous fruit trees and not cane berries, grapes and roses, but we forgot to change the description. So uh, anyway, they ended up not getting emphasized, but uh, grapes are a little tricky in that you need to know what you have before you know how to prune. Yeah, and it's, it's not hard to prune once you know what you have. You will take off a huge amount. Grapes are super vigorous and you will be amazed how much you take off and you'll think, oh my goodness, I can't take this all off, but you should. And the the UCIPM, if you if you go to the grapes, it it has a really good description of how to do it. So do both these books actually. And if you don't know if it's if you know what fruit, what kind of grape it is, but you don't know if it's cane bearing or spur bearing, I think Sunset has a pretty good table telling you which it is. Yeah. Somebody wants you to hold up that book again. Is that book in your reference, Kathleen, The Home Orchard? Um, yes, it is. They want The Home Orchard or they want The Pruning? The American Horticultural Society. <clears throat> I, I love The Home Orchard book. You're, yeah, yeah, there you go. Look at you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a big girl now. <laughs> you can put on your big girl pants. <laughs> You know where your, you know where your <laughs> camera is. It's right there. <laughs> All right. Any other questions, Cam? Yeah, we've got a few more here. So uh, this is an easy answer, but do you rake up the fruit tree leaves or leave them on the ground? And do you add them to your compost pile? Oh. If they're peach leaf curl, I rake them up and I put them in the green bin, everything else I leave. In fact, I do chop and drop. When I prune my tree, <clears throat> I just drop the branches down. The same. Perfect. Okay, so this one is a good one. Do you fertilize trees immediately after pruning? Um, would you recommend waiting until new growth comes out? How about applying compost and warm castings after pruning? <laughs> I would do it in spring. I, oh, well, I cannot Kathleen answer, but I would, if you're going to be, I don't fertilize my trees other than compost. And um, I do that in spring when it needs um, food to grow. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. Uh, do the same pruning principles apply to orange trees and Meyer lemon bushes in Southern California? Um, the, as far as making a good cut on a, a branch apply, but you don't prune citrus to be open centers. You don't want to expose citrus bark to the sun and you can do some thinning in the canopy, but, um, you don't really need to prune citrus that much. Yeah, I don't, I don't prune my citrus, although I do bring up I bring up the skirt a little bit because they do get ants. Yeah. I take some of the water sprouts out just because it's yeah. in the landscape. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, next question is, how do you find out chill hour requirements if it's not listed on the tag? Oh, there's a chart in the home orchard book. Yeah, it's... it's um, I would go to Trees of Antiquity or Dave Wilson. They will have it if you know the variety. Um, yeah, that's what I would do. The home, home orchard has like the basic trees, but they don't have a lot of the newer trees. Um, it's pretty easy to find though. DaveWilson.com, they have chill hours listed for each variety. Yeah, and you see A&R does also. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, 
next question is one of our apple trees produces loads of water sprouts. How and should we reduce them? If it's loads of them, I would say yes. Is it water sprouts or suckers? Is the person around? Um, yeah, I, <clears throat> you could reduce. It's hard to say without looking, but um, I would probably take some of them out and reduce some of them. Oh, it's water the sprouts. The ones closest to the trunk, I would probably reduce. And the ones that are further out, I would probably remove. And keep in mind, if, if you get fire blight, you may need to cut back to one of them to get rid of the fire blight. That's good advice. Thank you. Okay. All right. So when should Southern high bush blueberries be pruned? It's winter now, flowering, and has set fruit. Really? Wow. Wow. Um, usually in the winter, but not if it's, wow, it's messed up. Um, you know, the first two to three years, you don't want to prune your blueberries at all. And after that, you don't really need to prune them much. You mostly prune out dead and spent canes. They're, they're kind of, you know, canes come up out of the ground. Um, you want to prune out old canes and keep the new ones. But if they're still bearing fruit, I would keep them. Maybe open it up to the sun a little bit, but I wouldn't do much pruning on them. Okay, all righty. So, so the next question is about shovel prune. Uh, we prune fruit trees for fruit production. What's the sign for us to pull a fruit tree out? Should we just wait 20 years? What's the best way to pull an old fruit, fruit tree out? Cut it off at root level. Yeah, <laughs> cut it off at ground level and plant okay. right on top of it. Um, the best way to know when to cut a tree out is when there's more dead branches than live, I would say. Or when your production goes, to, if you're really doing it for fruit production, which it sounds like this person is, I mean, when your production really declines, I mean, an apple tree can live a hundred years or, or longer. Um, so if you, if you're, but peaches and I mean, I'm thinking 20 to 25 years for a peach. Yeah. yeah. And, and probably a plum too, yeah. but plums, you'll see just a ton of dead branches that I, I think when you see just a ton of dead branches, time to get a new one. Yeah. I hate to do this, everybody, but I am going to sign off and let Kathleen take the rest of the questions. I'm uh, sorry. When I set this up a long time ago, I didn't know I had a, a conflicting commitment. But thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you, Kathleen, for carrying on. Sure. Bye. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Lisa. All right, Kathleen, so we'll move on with the questions here. Okay. Um, so I was told that prior to pruning, we should check out what's the seasonal pests and diseases in the area, but where should I go for that info? I think we already covered this, but we'll... Yeah, I mean, I, I would look at UC IPM. It does California. It's not necessarily specific to this area, but I don't think... This area is that much different than like the Central Valley as far as insects and pests. Um, I wouldn't use East Coast references, which most books are East Coast. So get a California, the, the little tree is, a, is written by California. You can also talk to you if you have a good nursery nearby. Um, I think Golden is very good and Half Moon Bay Nursery is very good. They will, they will have a lot of insight also. Okay, and is there a reference that you recommend that describes when the best time to prune trees and shrubs are? Um, uh, if you go to, it's, it's Cass Turnbull up in, I think she's in Oregon. Just Google Cass Turnbull. 
It's T U R N, I think B U L L. If you type that in, you'll get it. Um, she actually does. She has a book that's very good on pruning and what time, and it goes through different kinds of plants and when you should prune them. All righty, thank you. Um, are there any tips on pruning figs? Uh, figs, you can prune anytime and you can do anything you want. <laughs> Figs are in the rubber tree family and they're, they're don't climb it because they'll break. But other than don't climb it, you can do pretty much anything to a fig you want. I prune mine all the time. And sometimes I don't prune it at all for a year. So figs are just super easy. That's pretty and, true. And they fruit, on, they fruit on new wood. So it doesn't matter when you prune them. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the next question is, should I cut my long branches on the plum tree from 10 feet down to eight feet? And will this cause the deadhead cut problem? If you prune it to something, if you prune it to an outward facing bud or something that's gonna take the energy, it won't. Um, if you just cut indiscriminately, it will. Although if it's 10 feet and you're cutting it down to eight feet, you're not cutting off a ton. So you won't get a super strong response. Alrighty. Um, none of my trees produced fruit last summer. What went wrong? <laughs> That's a big question. Um, have they produced fruit in the past? And what are their chill hour requirements? Did they get pollinated? And did they get watered? I mean, it's there's too many variables for me with the information given to tell you what went wrong. Um, if you wanna give me more specifics, you can send Can an email and she'll forward it to me. Yeah. I'd happy to answer that, but I can't tell you with as much information as I have. Yeah, and Kathleen, you had also mentioned that Young trees don't necessarily fruit right away. It yeah. takes a few years. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Okay. So then the next question is, um, my tangerines are crazy producers, and I'm afraid if I don't prune, the branches will break. Is it still okay, to pr okay not to prune? You know, if you thin the fruit, and tangerines are probably pretty little, um, but you can easily thin some of those out, especially... Thin out the most outward ones, you know, the ones furthest out from the trunk, because that's what puts more weight on that branch. Um, but you can prune citrus. I, I'm not saying you can't. You just don't need to, like you do other other trees. Okay. And is there a way to sh stop shoots from rootstock? Um, no, just cut them out. You know, like when I was showing you heading cuts and how you get that witch's broom, if you just cut the root stock, if you can go down and cut it at the root, you won't get as much growth from, from that. Because if you're just cutting it at ground level, you're just doing heading cuts and that's just going to cause more, more suckers. Okay. But there's nothing you can do. Some some rootstocks just sucker like crazy. Others don't. Yeah. They're they're pretty persistent for sure. Yeah. Um, okay. What about pomegranates and persimmons? Persimmons, you can you can prune after you harvest, which is right about now. And you know they're they're more of a canopy tree. I really wouldn't prune them so much to be such an open center they're they're a little bit wonkier than than the other trees but they fruit on next year's wood so whatever you cut off now is i mean you'll get a growth response but you're not cutting off fruit you don't like the other trees you don't want to cut off spurs and you're fruiting wood but persimmons fruit on new wood so you can pretty much do whatever you want to them just 
shape them how you want them in your landscape. And pomegranates, they're actually a bush and they get pretty crazy. I have a pomegranate in the front and I just kind of clean out the center a little bit and keep the size where I want it. Other than that, there's, there's not a ton you need to do to a pomegranate. They're pretty tough. Alrighty, so one last question here, but I know this is not really related to fruit trees, but what's the best time to prune oak trees? <laughs> well, yeah, <I'll> um, never. <laughs> I would say end of fall or, yeah, I don't, I don't know. Why are you pruning an oak? Um, I don't. Well, I, I guess I need more information. What kind of oak is it? Is it deciduous or evergreen? If it's deciduous, you could put it in winter. Um, if it's evergreen, I would wait until spring or fall. Um, but I would be very careful with pruning an oak that you're not damaging the tree. Yeah, and also a great resource is Dr. Lee Klinger. He, he would probably a, a great resource to reach out to for anything oak tree related, so. Yeah, and there's there's also a book at UCANR, Oak Trees in the Landscape, I think it's called, by um, Larry Costello, who is now growing oaks, that um, would be a good resource as well. All right, well, on that note, I think we covered most of the questions here. Um, any last closing remarks, Kathleen, before we sign off? Cover crop. You don't need to fertilize if you cover crop. <laughs> That's a different class. <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's my... <laughs> no, it's, it's a is, great class. and Everything and, yeah. is better with cover crops. Yeah. And I yeah. just listened to Doug Tallamy's book on um, Nature's Best Hope. Mm -hmm. And I now am cover cropping with California natives for our insect population. From seeds? Are you yeah. I mean, just really? Yeah, just, like I just wildflower seeds. seeds? Yeah, I'm just getting seeds from learners and um, throwing them out <laughs> instead of other seeds. Oh, that's great. Yeah. yeah. It's really awesome. Well, on that note, thank you everyone for attending today. Thank you. I know Lisa's already gone, but thank you, Lisa. And thank you, Kathleen, for a wonderful class yet again. And I'm sure we'll see you again next month for a fabulous okay. class. Okay. Um, all right, everyone. We'll see you next week. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>